Welcome and thank you for joining us for the VCA ACs webinar on upper extremity transplantation. This webinar is the second session in a multi webinar series on VCA for the transplant community, the need and the achieved debunking the myth. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the VCA AC Hub and the AST website by next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have any questions for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the question section in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are any questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the hub following the webinar. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. We kindly ask for you to fill this survey to keep us and our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Jamie Shores, to begin our presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we're talking about the need and the achieved as it a, a applies to upper extremity transplantation. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you all, I don't really have any relevant disclosures. I wish I had some, especially lucrative ones, but I have none. Um, I'm your moderator today. Uh, I'm a plastic surgeon and a senior acute hand surgeon in the plastic surgery department at Johns Hopkins. I'm also appointed in the orthopedic surgery department, which is a very different situation than one of our esteemed uh, panelists today. We have two, Dr. Scott Levin and Diane Atkins. And Dr. Levin, as everybody knows, is double boarded and has been chief of both of those departments or divisions in the past. So I, I just am, am a member of, of two departments. Um, I'm the hand fellowship director here at Johns Hopkins and clinical director of hand and upper extremity transplantation. We're here today because uh, sometimes bad things happen and uh, sometimes things work out, sometimes they don't. So we wanna be prepared for every situation uh, that we encounter. And so maybe we're successful with our major limb replantation, maybe we're not. Maybe uh, somebody has a need that has nothing to do with an, a traumatic acute loss. Maybe they had a, a loss long ago, they had an ischemic loss. Uh, infection or a tumor, maybe a congenital loss. And so we want to have strategies to try to help people with upper extremity loss or absence um, in multiple clinical contexts, especially uh, treating the patient in the context of their own life, assessing their own needs, understanding their individual and specific circumstances. And so strategies that we have for trying to help people deal with upper limb loss have traditionally been prosthetics. This is the most common option available here in the United States as well as worldwide. They're widely available. Uh, there's a vast array of technological possibilities. All of us uh, think about probably our first encounter with prosthetics being body powered hook and cable uh, um, prosthetics that are extremely functional for, for many people. Um, but we also have had uh, technological advancements that have created some really wonderful uh, myoelectric prosthetics that are uh, computers with motors that move that are essentially the extent to extent extensions of robotic arms. Um, and the outcomes and utility of these vary by both the level of amputation, how dedicated a person is to using those things, and the level of technology that they're using. Although that level of technology uh, for many levels of amputation may not be that big of a determinant of uh, how much they use their prosthesis, interestingly. But we have this other more newer, uh, when you consider the long history of prosthetics uh, and less available option uh, of hand and upper extremity transplantation. It's done in a lot fewer places uh, and it's less widely available. It's used only in very select candidates. Um, and it has the downside of requiring that a person become a transplant patient for the rest of their lives, or at least the rest of the life of the allotransplant that we place upon them. 
For the use of prosthetics, we have continued to evolve and we've even uh, created surgical strategies to try to help prosthetics work better with people. This is an illustration of something called targeted muscle reinnervation that was developed by Drs. Greg Demanian and Todd Kaiken at Northwestern University, which allows us to help people use complex myoelectric prosthetics for above elbow uh, uh, amputations uh, in much more useful manners than used to be available. We can even do this for shoulder disarticulation patients where we can do these nerve transfers to chest wall muscles to try to give them intuitive motor control for a complex uh, prosthesis, which, uh, and here's an example of one of our patients here, a bilateral shoulder disarticulation patient will expose their terminal nerves coming off the brachial plexus, remove the neuromas, transfer them into the chest wall, and they can use really incredibly advanced prosthetics if they have them available to them, such as these modular prosthetic limbs or MPLs that were developed by the Applied Physics Lab uh, using you know, DOD funds from DARPA and other uh, places to come up with really almost science fiction uh, type of hardware. Here's an example of a patient that was our first TMR uh, recipient at Hopkins for the transhumeral amputation. This is him using his prosthesis for the first time ever, and it looks like the video is not running, so I'll go past it, but this video is working. And so this is that, that same patient several years later, then expanding past just TMR with an advanced prosthesis to a next level of innovation called osseointegration. And this is a metal implant that gets placed into the humerus. It extends out of the skin, permanently, and that prosthesis can be attached directly to it, so it's got direct skeletal connection. His osseointegration wasn't done here at Hopkins, it was done at University of Pittsburgh, but we've since started our own program here that's very active, and this can be a real game changer for amputees, especially lower extremity amputees, which are the most common to use this technology, but for our upper limb amputees, it gives people a, position, a, a sense of uh, position with their limb, they don't use a socket, uh, they don't have to worry about sweating the socket off, and uh, they have much more biomechanical advantage when they use their uh, prosthesis. We can do this combined with TMR, such as we did here, or we can do it separately. Here, I, this patient didn't have enough uh, motors to use TMR to amplify those peripheral nerve signals, so we brought up a, a free muscle uh, flap, did TMR at the same time, come back, revise the soft tissue use and put in the osseointegrative implant. And here's what one looks like on x-ray. This is an example of the uh, Biomet Zimmer compress device, which is a one option. We use a lot more of uh, another device called an OPRA for this. And this is that patient, the first time he gets his prosthesis ever, and he's intuitively able to use this. He lives in New York, and this is the message he wanted to send me. I try not to read too much into it. The next evolution of osseointegration is uh, the second generation of the OPRA device, uh, which is the e -OPR device. And to give people some background, osseointegration was first invented uh, as a, uh, to be used for dental implants and facial implants. Um, and uh, this was, research was done back in the 1960s. That oral surgeon's son, is a guy named Dr. Ricard Pranamark, who most orthopedic surgeons uh, know as the uh, modern day inventor of osseointegration for major limb replantation. And he had, I'm sorry, major limb amputation. And he has experience going well past 20 years with patients helping them use upper and lower extremity prosthetics when they had no hope of using these previously. And it's been a game changer for some of our most uh, badly injured uh, patients. And the original device was a porous titanium coated implant that would be tapped in, which would require long bone to be tapped and then screwed in. And those threads really expand the amount of surface area that the bone can integrate into the titanium implant with. He's since gone on and created a second generation, which allows us to hardwire the peripheral nerves, either through the, amp the signal amplification uh, uh, machines of muscles with targeted muscle renovation or RPNIs or directly to nerves if such uh, nerve cuffs are being used anywhere and then run that through the bone and into the implant and then connect those signals directly to the prosthesis through the implant so that wires and Bluetooth 
transcutaneous uh, detectors aren't necessary. And so this provides direct neurological control uh, without the need for some of these other extraneous steps. So this is the next uh, advancement in the most type of the most advanced type of prosthesis control. This is our first time using the eOPR device. This is a shoulder disarticulation patient had to have a custom designed total shoulder replacement implant uh, that was designed and, and created with uh, Jonathan Forsberg, who's a orthopedic oncology surgeon from Walter Reed, who is uh, part-time on staff here at Johns Hopkins, and we appreciate the military lending him to us. Uh, he designed this implant. We surgically implanted this and then performed TMR to the muscles that remained and then implanted our, uh, our bipolar electrodes uh, and then ran them through the implant. This is what the x-ray looks like. And so we can, this implant will accept the eOPRA implant, which we've implanted into the patient and are awaiting prosthesis training now. So I've talked a whole bunch about stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with transplantation. So where does VCA fit in? This is a VCA talk. Well, what I've been showing you are gradual advancements, trying to make prosthetics uh, that essentially mimic and attached to our bodies, just like a living hand and arm would. And so the alternative, obviously to that is why not just give them, them a living hand and arm that doesn't require batteries, doesn't require frequent repair, uh, doesn't have servos that wear out, uh, doesn't discharge its power source and then become you know dead. Um, and so the best thing we can do in that situation is try to replace what's been lost with a living uh, version of these advanced uh, limbs, which is just a human limb. So the advantage of a transplanted limb is it doesn't come off unless your surgeon takes it off. You get sensory feedback from it uh, once the sensory nerves regenerate appropriately, and you have intuitive control over it. And this is an enormous advantage over the standard uh, and even advanced myelectric prosthetics that we have. There is some sensory feedback that is trying to be engineered with sensory nerve transfers and things, but this is in its infancy. Patients have improved body image and sense of self because we've restored a missing part of their body. Um, these transplants are self-healing. They rarely require repair the way that these advanced prosthetics do. These advanced prosthetics are incredible computers and engineering feats that as you use them to interact with a real world environment tend to wear out and break and get damaged. And so when you meet patients who have had TMR, have advanced pattern recognition algorithms combined with their advanced myoelectric prosthetics, what you'll find is they need a couple of these things, sometimes even three, because one or two of them is usually in the shop. The disadvantages to transplantation as it compares to the prosthetic is the obvious lifelong immunotherapy that's required, which all of these patients, if they're on calcineurin inhibitors, especially for long enough, develop uh, chronic kidney disease. And some of these patients will progress to full kidney failure requiring hemodialysis and potential kidney transplant. The other obvious problems are being more susceptible to tumors and infections. Um, all of our VCA patients require long, long periods and, and really, realistically, lifelong dedication to hand therapy and rehabilitation to not just maximize their function, but to maintain it. If they don't continue to do therapy exercises, they can lose function. It requires ongoing medical care and surveillance because they're not only going to develop all the health problems that we normally develop as we age, but those health problems may be compounded by their immunotherapy. Their health problems may have interactions with the immunotherapy uh, medications when they require medical treatment for those things. I put expense down here as an advantage and a disadvantage for both of these because it's not quite clear uh, which is the obvious winner. Most of us would think that transplantation is probably the most expensive modality, but when you really think about people getting modern, up-to-date myoelectric prosthetics needing multiple of them and probably requiring new ones of those every 10 years or so, just like you would get a new car or other uh, computer-based, I mean, a laptop, really, I'm giving you a laptop, my, this talk on a six-year-old laptop, and this crashed during a national meeting uh, two months ago. Uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, 
many people expect that a bilateral amputee could easily use, you know, near $3 million worth of equipment over the course of their life. And so uh, there may be more cost parity between these modalities than we think. So the goals of this webinar today are to discuss the treatment of upper extremity loss, focusing on VCA and prosthetic rehabilitation. Are, we also want to learn about the difficulty in outcome measurement comparing these groups and what strategies we can employ as we try to continue to become more, more objective in our assessments so that we can better try to discern who is gonna benefit the most from a VCA versus a conventional or advanced prosthetics. To accomplish this goal today, we have really uh, esteemed faculty that uh, we are lucky to have with us. Uh, Dr. Scott Levin, who I'm going to introduce despite the fact that to most of us, he needs no introduction. He's dual boarded orthopedic and plastic surgeon with a CAQ in hand surgery. He's been the previous chief of plastic surgery at Duke and he's the current chairman of orthopedic surgery at Penn. And I don't know any other surgeon that can claim they've led both groups like that past president of ASSH, AHS, ASRT, like if it has an acronym, I think Dr. Levin has led it. He's the chair of the American College of Surgeons Board of Regents, co-director of the Penn Nerve Center, and he's the head of Penn's VCA program with a large amount of experience in VCA, including a very historic pediatric double hand transplant that all of us are probably familiar with. In addition to Dr. Levin, we also have Diane Atkins. She's an internationally recognized occupational therapist who specializes in upper limb rehabilitation. She has over 40 years of experience working with children and adult upper extremity amputees. She's been a real resource for our military, especially as the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars uh, started up and uh, they anticipated large amounts of uh, injured uh, war fighters uh, that they wanted to provide the best care possible. And so she was relied upon to try to help develop those care plans. Uh, she focuses on study of functional outcomes with prosthetic use and has studied this in hand transplant patients in addition to prosthetic users. And she's been very active with ASRT in advocating for the evolution of functional outcome measures for BCA of the upper limb. So we're going to start off by turning it over to Dr. Levin, and I just want to say thank you to both of you for participating in this important discussion. And Dr. Levin, uh, we will uh, kick it off with you. Uh, Jamie, it says you can't start the screen share while others are sharing. Uh, so I said, okay, so share screen. Can you see that? Yeah, try, try hitting your share screen again. Uh-oh. Uh Um, do you see my, uh, here it is. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay. I think we're ready to go. You can hear me. So, uh, my charge, uh, first of all, uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, uh, Dr. Shores is an internationally, uh, regarded, uh, and highly skilled, uh, upper extremity surgeon, but has lived in the VCA hand, uh, world for many, many years, and I have great regard for him. Uh, Diane Atkins, I've gotten to know through the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, and again, uh, is an outstanding therapist who, again, has tried to move this field forward. What is the field? It's not just hand transplant. It's providing a modern array of choices now, OI, osseointegration, targeted muscle reinnervation, advanced prosthetics, uh, conventional prosthetics, and yes, vascularized composite alloy transplant. So I was asked to talk about what we have achieved in hand alloy transplantation, and Dr. Shores gave a very balanced perspective. I do think it's important to provide my disclosures. Uh, all of these are um, uh, grant funding agencies uh, for our work uh, in VCA in the uh, basic science lab and in outcomes and so forth. So uh, nothing uh, works better, I think, than to present a patient and believe it or not, in clinic. Uh, this gentleman walked in with his wife. He has a four-year-old, a 13-month-old. Uh, he is a nurse himself. He's a healthcare provider. Uh, and several months ago, he didn't feel well. The classic story of sepsis 
leading to the evolution of what we call the quadrimembral amputee. Here are his lower extremities, his upper extremities, and comes into my clinic with his wife next to him. Um, what was the first thing I told him, Dr. Atkins and Dr. Shores? We can't even discuss VCA without you uh, vigorously engaging in modern prosthetic care. It's the responsibility of somebody such as myself, who is an ardent believer in VCA to, and, and I'm gonna say this carefully, Dr. Shores, initially turn patients away, or the corollary is, these patients must be afforded conventional care, quote unquote, conventional care for limb loss before we move on to uh, VCA. So what have we learned over 22 years since uh, Max Dubernard, the late Dr. Dubernard, um, did the first uh, unilateral hand transplant in a New Zealand prisoner, a technical success, a therapeutic disaster, followed by Dr. Warren Breidenbach, who did Matt Scott, who's a public finger figure, who 22 years later has a functioning unilateral hand transplant on his immunosuppression, and we could talk for hours about this, but this is a patient that I saw on Monday in my clinic. Am I delighted? Am I thrilled? Are these patients out there? Is this a population that has to benefit from all the things you're gonna hear about today? The answer is yes. Where are these patients? Which ones will be appropriate for VCA? So Dr. Shores gave me some assignments reasonable expectations. This Now we're talking about vascularized composite allergy transplant. Expectations are there will be a well-prepared team. We've seen around the world serendipity. Oh, we'll give this a try. Patient, patient death in the operating room for an unprepared, unrehearsed team. Issues of informed consent, ethics. We are following solid organ transplant protocol. UNOS, uh, has an entire VCA uh, committee subset, as does AST, I'm a member, as ASTS. So the concept of VCA, we're talking about hands today, but other quote unquote organs um, have been approved in the final rule by Secretary Sebelius years ago. We're working uh, towards uh, improving everything we do in this field. Certain reasonable expectations, if we're gonna do a VCA on any patient, surgical rehearsal and preparation, essential. Strong solid organ transplant support and partnership. Uh, reconstructive plastic surgeons like Dr. Shores and myself and our colleagues around the world must have buy-in, guidance, support, immediate availability of our physician colleagues in transplant of our surgical colleagues who do solid organ transplant for the liability, the acute problems that occur such as rejection, uh, renal failure and other things. Defining the therapy expectations for the patient, Dr. Shores alluded to this. And we've also learned uh, that the support of any candidate is critical. Somebody who lives alone, who's recently had limb loss, who sadly is underserved or underprivileged and does not have the social support despite a technically optimal patient cannot reasonably be considered for vascularized allergy transplant. Too many moving parts, too many peri and post-operative issues. So those patients are eliminated and may be best served by conventional prosthetics. By the way, to the audience, I'm not selling anything. Am I a fervent believer in VCA? I am, but you can't ignore non-immunosuppressed patients like Dr. Shore showed you with an osteo-integrated implant uh, with TMR. And then the psychiatric profile of the patient must be understood. We have to expect this is drilled down with patient advocates, with psychiatric testing, psychology testing, all of these patients that have the kind of limb loss that I showed you have PTSD. As communicative and as socially appropriate and intelligent as the patient uh, that I just showed you a few minutes ago, you can imagine, and I would say myself, I would have PTSD. I said, what do you think? 
He said, I'm not ready to come back into the hospital yet. Even if he wanted it, he, he's not emotionally ready. So all these things enter in. Here are the different levels. Who's a good candidate? Dr. Shores asked me to talk about this. Again, a separate talk could take hours, but these are all of the levels that have been done. Who's a good candidate? Even subdeltoid, some of the shoulder disartics or that uh, tumor prosthetic from Dr. Forsberg that Dr. Shores showed you um, had the reconstruction that was offered. But there are patients, for example, Christoph Honig from Germany has a farmer that had subdeltoid right below the shoulder level, uh, bilateral hand amputees who's functioning on his farm has regained elbow flexion extension, some moderate hand function. It can be done, should it be done, but virtually any level below the uh, deltoid. The other unknown, and you might ask about this, is the uh, congenital patient does not have cortical representation in the brain of an upper extremity. Again, another matter, but I think most of the patients we see and we even decide to consider are quadrimembranal amputees. Uh, those that have rehab that are functioning with good level, lower extremity prosthetics. Team, in 22 years, we've learned a lot. I'm trying to go through this very quickly. Recipient characteristics, somebody who's alcohol or drug dependent, no social support again, multiple comorbidities. What about the patient that's had multi-organ system failure with marginal renal function? Then we're gonna put that patient on calcineurin inhibitors. Danger, danger, danger. And one of the patients in our series that we've done so far had a very successful renal transplant 10 years after the initial bilateral functioning and successful hand transplants. And this story is being repeated. We have yet to see retransplant in the hand or upper extremity VCA uh, population, but it has happened as you know, in face. So at some point, the half-life of our transplants uh, may wear out, ongoing fibrosis, rejection. I'm not talking about the patients that have been amputated for a variety of reasons after initial transplant, but they have to understand this and this is evolving. And what's the mechanism of limb loss? Sepsis, trauma, blast injury in our military and so forth. So what's been achieved? Look at, look, let's look at national organizations. Okay, national AST has a VCA committee, ASTS, TTS, UNOS has invested in the VCA committee. Dr. Shores and I have served together, I've shared this. The International Society for Vascularized Composite Allo Transplant has a uh, large registry of every VCA that's been performed in the world, accumulating data. The new society, the American Society of Reconstructive Transplantation began in 2008 in an answer in America to what was evolving in France and some other countries. And I would argue that America, America is falling behind in VCA for a variety of reasons, not least of which is how will these patients be funded? We've had consensus conferences with Dr. Lee, Dr. Shores at Hopkins. What's been achieved? Many successful upper extremity transplants with functioning uh, grafts, with uh, quality of life improved, with patient reported outcomes, very, very favorable in comparison to good outcomes with prosthetics. And as you saw, osseo integration and other upper extremity reconstructive options. And again, the longest hand transplant that we know of is, um, uh, uh, Dr. Breidenbach's uh, first patient, uh, who uh, Matt Scott is still functioning. He served on our VCA uh, UNOS committee uh, and uh, of course have had some morbidity such as avascular necrosis of his hips and so forth, but 22 years with a functioning graft. I think that's pretty good. So where are we going? First of all, and again, these are questions from Dr. Shores and I know Dr. Atkins will weigh in we originally, I'd say the VCA uh, communities in face and hand and recently in uterus have been isolated, siloed, even competitive. That has all changed. Before COVID, 
In 2019, we had a consensus conference where we have collaborative efforts in all of VCA, but our hand group is very strong. And I wanna recognize the support uh, from Andy Lee historically uh, and Jamie uh, Shores. We're all great colleagues and mutually support, supportive. Hearing of Mayo, probably Steve Moran in there and Mardini, uh, that's, that's a great thing. We have great achievement collectively hearing that certain centers are achieving. We wanna be collaborative and, and complementary, not competitive. Um, the funding, who's gonna pay? HHS, CMS, DOD, this is a critical issue. If we can't get past this, like Tom Starzl got past funding for liver transplants, this field directly to all of you is on life support. Outcomes research, it's like pornography. We know a good outcome when we see it. Uh, one of our patients, a woman, bilateral transplant, excellent function, creatinine 0 0.6, is now married and pregnant with her first child. I doubt that would have taken place with conventional prosthetics or her remaining as a quadrimembranal. How do we define success? I think we know it, but yet people are clamoring for outcomes data. Our DOD grant and others are working in this space to define what we know as success. The renal issue from the calcineurin inhibitors um, needs to be solved. We have an array now of transplant patients in face and hand that have had kidneys successfully done, maintaining their original VCA organ of face or hand. That's good, but not ideal. Um, I think the international cooperation is getting more. Uh, we've been able to do transatlantic uh, uh, VCAs here at Penn, uh, extending the reach for procurement uh, and working with our OPOs and some research into ex vivo uh, perfusion of, uh, of body parts may heart, help her uh, have promise for the future. So I'm gonna show uh, a six minute video that summarizes our program, and then we'll move on to Dr. Atkins. Zion Harvey lost both hands and legs below the knee when willing he was just to try the still rare procedure sur les conseils du professeur Lantieri Laura s'inscrit sur la liste d'attente aux États-Unis hand transplant surgery a procedure so delicate and rare giving Lindsay and new hands on real ones from a donor there, there's an expression in surgery preparation is the only shortcut you need are endlessly expressive. They help us convey thoughts and feelings. Soothe with a gentle touch. Enable us to care for ourselves and for others. There's perhaps no better way we express ourselves than through our hands. Living a life Without hands, a person loses a sense of self. Independence is challenged. Dependent on others for the most basic tasks, it is impossible not to become isolated from the outside world. A vital method for establishing human connection is lost. I've accepted the fact that my feet are gone. Like, that's acceptable to me. My hands is not, it's still not. In my dreams, I always have my hands. I know from the experience we've had at Penn with patients who have had hand transplants that just the mere fact that their body image is restored, uh, they can wave, they can gesticulate like I'm doing when I'm speaking, that's a pretty profound thing when you, you think about it. As one of only a few medical centers in the world where this surgery is performed, Penn Medicine is breaking new ground for transplant patients by connecting the top medical experts locally and around the world to conquer new frontiers in the emerging field of vascularized composite aloe transplantation, the transplant of body parts such as hands and faces to recipients who have lost these parts. 
The discipline of vascularized composite allotransplantation uses an operating microscope to guide the connection of arteries, veins, and nerves. It is a new discipline, as innovative and exciting as any in medicine today. Hours and hours of surgical rehearsal and practice over two years' time allow the team to prepare for each patient's operation. Envisioning the possibilities has become the life's work of Penn Surgeon, Dr. L. Scott Levin. I trained uh, first, I uh, did fusion general surgery, where I was exposed to pediatric surgery. And then I trained in orthopedics and did my pediatric orthopedic surgery at the Shriners Hospital System. I did all the congenital hand surgery at Duke for almost 20 years. Then came to Philadelphia and being trained both in orthopedics and plastic surgery and doing lots of pediatric microsurgery, pediatric hand surgery, um, pediatric reconstructive surgery. The world of hand surgery, of course, is in adults and children. This is an absolute passion of mine, and uh, I've always loved that. And this is just the next extension of hand transplant surgery. Connecting all the dots to make this complex, multidisciplinary surgery a success is a monumental undertaking. By marshalling the best and brightest in their respective disciplines, Dr. Levin has assembled a team that is second to none and orchestrated it to perfection. In team, the acronym is Together Everyone Achieves More, T-E-A-M, and I've always believed that. You know, this is a cast of many entities, our internal medicine colleagues, uh, anesthesia, nursing, social work, pharmacy. Uh, these kinds of operations touch everyone in a health system. So we had really incredible surgical talent. Last summer, Zion made history, becoming the first ever child recipient of a double hand transplant. The nearly 11-hour procedure paving a long road to recovery, marked with a rigorous therapy regimen. Earlier this month, he got to throw out the first pitch at the Baltimore Orioles game. Laura s'est très vite appropriée ses nouvelles mains. Elle commence à plier ses doigts, à bouger ses poignets, à tenir des objets. So have you looked yet? No. Okay. I've only looked, peeked down at this one thumb. They feel like normal fingers, you know, normal hands. This is more than we could ever hope for. Her blood pressure is good. All the parameters are good related to how the blood flow is in and out of her new arms. I mean, this is a, if you will, a picture perfect course so far. Hi guys. Hi. 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 Yes. What has happened at Penn Medicine is not science fiction. It is real science involving real people. Here, now, today. As in any emerging field, there is still much more to be learned. But with Dr. Levin's leadership in this highly specialized discipline, Penn Medicine is going beyond excellence and eminence to preeminence, giving his patients a chance they could only dream of a short time ago, to reconnect with others and with the world. So uh, that's uh, an overview of our program, Dr. Shores. And uh, at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Terrific. Now we're going to pass the mic over to Diane Atkins, who's going to talk about a little bit more about prosthetics and a little bit more about how we should be trying to objectively measure uh, outcomes, I think. Great. Uh, can everyone hear me? Jamie, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, super. Uh, do I see a full screen? Let me try screen share. Uh, whoops. Okie doke. All set. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Levin, that was an awesome presentation, as was yours, uh, Dr. Shores, and that video was terrific. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introductions, and thank you uh, primarily for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, it's been a joy for me during the last several years to know uh, Dr. Shores and Dr. Levin, as well as many in the uh, VCA world, nationally and internationally. And uh, yes, I bring 40, over 40 years of experience to this discussion today, which has been my passion, working with amputees and uh, specifically um, a great deal of knowledge about their prosthetic experience. So what are some of the questions to consider in today's discussion? Well, what do upper extremity amputees need and what are the unmet needs in current upper extremity prosthetics? Is hand transplantation an appropriate alternative to consider when and what are the indications? And I'm actually asked this frequently by many amputees. How can awareness be raised regarding hand VCA in the amputee population? Where is third-party payer and insurance awareness? And what is the future of insurance reimbursement in hand VCA? I've been fortunate to be involved with hundreds and hundreds of children and adults uh, with unilateral and bilateral limb loss. And I've shared uh, many of those experiences with uh, many other authors in two comprehensive textbooks. Okay, as a point of reference as to how I became involved in hand VCA, in 2014, I was approached by Dr. Neil Jones, professor and chair of orthopedic surgery at UC Irvine. Um, he was interested in this topic and he, as he was aware of the uh, advances that were being made in multi-articulating hands, and he wanted to learn more. Um, his patients with toe to hand transfers were also included in this study. And so with Dr. Jones, I embarked upon a research designed to look specifically at outcomes in hand transplants, electric multi-articulating hands and toe to hand transfers. And specifically, how do we define success in these populations? A Little bit of a background of this study. To date, there had never been a national or international effort designed to compare the dexterous abilities, functional outcomes and disability experience of individuals who had been fit with advanced electric multi-articulating hands and digits, toe to hand transfers and hand transplantations. I'm just gonna uh, focus on the eight bilateral participants in this study. We had 26, but uh, for the purposes of today, I really wanna look at the bi bilateral because I believe that most of us um, agree that the bilateral is the candidate that is most appropriate. There were three bilateral amputees fit with electric multi-articulating hands, four bilateral amputees with hand transplants, two from the US, one from Johns Hopkins, one from Penn, and two from, um, from Austria, from Dr. Stefan Schneeberger's group in Innsbruck. Additionally, this was Dr. Jones' phenomenal patient, um, a young man who was burned in Romania with two um, palm only presentations. Dr. Um, Jones uh, did a six toe transfer to um, both palms, three toes to each hand. This gives you a quick snapshot of just one of the um, outcome measures that we used. The Southampton hand ass assessment procedure, which actually is a very nice um, outcome metric. It studies eight different prehensile patterns of grasp. It also includes eight abstract objects and 14 bilateral activities of daily living. And as you can see in the three groups, there was not a great deal of difference in terms of their functional um, index of function, which actually was quite high on a score of one to 100. Okay, let's take a look at one of these individuals. Um, this is a, a young lady from the Johns Hopkins group. And as you can see, she has phenomenal bilateral dexterous coordination. Um, she developed um, bilateral uh, meningitis in 2003 and had her bilateral transplants in 2009. 
She is totally independent. And as you can see from this video, which every time I see it, I'm amazed that these are two hand transplants. Um, she is uh, a phenomenal outcome. Whoops, sorry. Okay, let's look at Jason. Jason is perhaps the most skilled body powered and myoelectric multi-articulating hand user in the country, if not the world. In 2008, he was electrocuted with 7,200 volts of electricity. He is totally independent um, with both body powered prostheses as well as electric hands and electric hooks. And although he cannot um, feel with these hands, he is visually uh, watching what he is doing and kinesthetically um, he can feel through his hands, um, the pressure, so his, as he does not crush these eggs. Truly an amazing um, outcome and user of these hands. Okay, so yes, prosthetic technology has advanced dramatically for proximal levels of limb loss, as well as partial hand loss. And much of this has been since the Iraq and Afghanistan wars when the Department of Defense and DARPA invested millions in upper and lower extremity prostheses and prosthetic research. With that said, BCA for Hands demonstrates dramatic, dramatic advances as well. All of these photos were taken during my time spent with these bilateral hand transplant recipients. And frankly, I was amazed at what they were able to achieve. And as an occupational therapist with over 40 years of experience, I had no exposure or awareness of hand BCA previous to my involvement in this study, which maybe says something. I really believe we need to be much more aggressive in sharing the outcomes of these folks. And then of course, we have the incredible success of Zion um, that was beautifully presented in that um, video from Dr. Levin. So what are the current developments and advances in upper extremity prosthetic design? Well, Dr. Shores stole some of my thunder there, but I'll cover it quickly. Um, compliant electric multi-articulating hands and digits. Um, these prehensile patterns are controlled by myoelectric sensors, RFIDs, as well as more recently gesture control. Osseo integration is also a dramatic advance. TMR, RPNI, and pattern recognition. Uh, just a little bit of a synopsis again of these amazing multi articulating hands. They are individually powered digits, multi articulating fingers, a rotatable thumb, non back drivable digits, and various grasping patterns. They are also applicable for the partial hand amputee, which is very exciting. These are eye digits, and these are externally powered. They're also articulating with an individual stall out ability, meaning that they can hold what they are, um, what they are grasping um, for sustained periods of time. They have a manually rotatable thumb if one does not have their thumb um, present in their, uh, in their hand presentation. Compliant grip, very grip, auto grasp. So there's slip detection. If you're holding a glass, um, you lose your attention and you start to lose what you're holding. It will automatically um, be aware of that and maintain your grasp. And automatic grip patterns and gestures. This is an example of a young, uh, young woman who was uh, born with a congenital limb difference, as you can see below. As a child, she was completely independent, but as, as an adult, excuse me, as an adolescent, she wanted more function as well as better appearance. So for her, the partial hand eye digit option was a terrific alternative. Osseo integration, I won't go into uh, much detail here because Dr. Shores did a great job there. As you know, it's a surgical alternative it, that involves direct bone anchorage. No harness is required. You have excellent range of motion based on the principle uh, um, that was developed back in uh, the 1960s. And sensory feedback, interestingly, is reported to a certain extent to be improved 
because of the phenomenon of what is described as osseo perception. The benefits again were reviewed, less weight, more control, no perspiration, pain or tissue breakdown, no need to remake sockets, easier donning and doffing, the osseo perception. Challenges um, with, there are two distinctly different um, osseo integration um, techniques. The one that is more uh, frequently done here in the States, two surgeries are required and it does involve a relatively long rehabilitation period. And there is the risk for deep infection. This is something new, sensory feedback with implantable myoelectric sensors or IMEs still very much in the R&D stage, but basically we are providing advanced control of prosthetic hands um, in order to restore sensations such as touch and finger position. As I said, it's still in the R&D phase, but um, a myoelectric implant will detect muscle signals for control of the prosthesis and an implantable neurostimulator will activate peripheral nerves to restore sensation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, TMR, as was just described, it not only has the advantage of doing all these good things, but also, as you know, it's, it's uh, very um, effective in diminishing the frequency of neuromas, which are a chronic problem for many upper limb and lower limb amputees. These are some examples of some folks who were successfully um, fit following um, targeted muscle re -innervation. But back to our question, what is the greatest unmet need in upper extremity prostheses today? Well, obviously it's our sense of touch. Sensory awareness, also known as haptic awareness. Are we there with prosthetic hands? No, we're not. It's um, an ongoing quest of upper extremity prosthetics today. So back to our topic today, how can we share the success of hand transplantation? I really want to see this happen. We need to increase the exposure of the outcomes that we have achieved. And we need to provide proof in standardized and validated evidence-based outcome measures. And we need to be consistent in what we use. There probably are no less than 30 or 40 objective and subjective outcome measures. And to Dr. Shores and Dr. Levin's credit, we did initiate, um, I was involved in that, an ASRT outcomes consensus conference on this topic in November of 2018 in Penn, at Penn. Um, it was an excellent meeting um, that was designed to uh, address the challenge of identifying consistently and useful and meaningful metrics. Why? Well, <clears throat> we really need to look at how these um, procedures are going to be paid for. Future reimbursement from insurance carriers are dependent upon knowing and needing to know more. I work as a clinical specialist with the largest case management company in the United States, and I've become very familiar with what these companies are asking for, and bottom line is they want proof of success. So where do we go from here? These are some of my thoughts. We need additional studies to include prosthetic wearers and hand transplant patients. We need to continue to build bridges of understanding between your world, the VCA world, my world, the rehabilitation world, and the third party payer world. We need to define success in a way that's universally understood and a common language of reporting that's not just anecdotal evidence, but based on um, the evidence based outcome metrics that we define. And last, we need to enable the individual who has lost one or both arm, arms to make an informed decision. So this concludes my presentation and I look forward to any Q&A that may follow. And I'll turn the, the, uh, the chair, the podium back to Dr. Shores. Thank you. Wonderful, Diane. Thank you so much for that great talk.
Uh, we've got some questions here. And if Dr. Levin's still here, he's got a hard stop because he's got to give another transplant talk immediately at three. Um, I'm going to skip directly to uh, Dr. Amer's question uh, for him. It says, are these highly sophisticated? I'm sorry, that's not it. Uh, where was it? Here we go. What about procurement, Jamie? And yeah, that's that's it. I'm looking for. It. Can you comment yeah. on BCA? Yeah, no. yeah, real real quick, and then I have to go because I'm talking to our transplant institute. Yeah, I think I don't know. I can't speak for Hopkins, Jamie, but working with Gift of Life, our regional people, I think finding the donors isn't that hard. We've had some issues about awareness in the OPO community, but we have so few people listed. You know, I you know we're getting even offers on the patient we have now. Uh, so I haven't seen that as a problem. That's my quick answer. Want to recognize our OPOs and our partners and the support of AST and ASTS here. Um, you know, we can always do better. The UNOS VCA committee is working through a lot of issues uh, on identification and, uh, you know, these things. But I need to sign off. Uh, and I hope that answers the question. Thank you for the privilege of uh, participating. Now I have to talk to my own people. Have See a great talk. Thank you Thank so much. You. So uh, I just want to add on to what Dr. Uh, Levin said about that. You know, so donation is a tricky thing. Uh, we never want campaigns that emphasize, you know, donation awareness or donor awareness to compromise the ability of our OPOs to uh, be able to secure life-saving organs for people on heart, lung, kidney, liver, transplant list, things like that. And so the OPOs are incredibly skillful at approaching patients uh, in a compassionate way that tries to take a lot of what many people will consider the morbidity of asking for, a, for a, an arm or a hand donation away from it. And if they sense that a family's just not ready for that, they won't even approach it because again, they never want to endanger the donation of a life-saving organ, which we greatly appreciate and are very sensitive to. There are certain groups that uh, donate less than other groups and that can have an impact on VCA because these are external organs. And so when we try to match transplants, we're trying to match similar size, similar skin tone, um, we're not always matching gender, but but uh, but in many cases we we are trying to match gender. Uh, there are there is there is some gender catch up that can happen over time just because of the circulating hormonal milieu of the recipient. But it is a lot harder for people with darker skin tones to get a uh, a match because most of the uh, donors, uh, you know, the donor pool for for those skin tones is smaller than the donor pool with lighter skin tones uh, in many respects, and so. Um, especially if we have a unilateral patient where we're trying to match skin tones, we're looking for a you know very close match. If it's bilateral, it doesn't have to be quite as close, but we still try to keep it in the ballpark because we think that helps with psychological acceptance uh, and uh, socialization uh, issues. So all of those are are um, limiting factors. But that being said, there isn't this long wait list where people are fighting over each other for the same organ. Um, like we have with liver and heart and kidney where where multiple you know where there's just a, a list longer than the organ availability so it's really a matter of not only are we trying to match the uh, same immunological characteristics that a solid organ patient needs to match but we're trying to match these physical characteristics too which make these organs a lot more unique harder to match and so the larger donor pool we get the greater the opportunity we have to do that and so i, I guess that's what i'll conclude that question with is we just need to expand the donor pool as much as possible so that we can capture all of the phenotypes in addition to the immunotypes. Um, let's back up here now. There's a question from, uh, actually, I think I answered, that was Jim Rodriguez's question. Uh, uh, Dr. Mayer, are these highly sophisticated prosthetics available to all amputees or is this funding and coverage also a problem? Diane, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. And I, I can see we're on, we are we are at the end of our hour, but I'll just say briefly, it's a tremendous challenge and problem. Yes. And we are also tasked with being able to prove 
um, the cost, which exceeds $100,000, even for a transradial amputation these days and for an advanced prosthesis at that level. So yes, um, it is not a given that these um, advanced prostheses are going to be approved. Um, in the workers' comp world uh, that I work, um, as long as the, the functional needs are well documented, we stand a pretty good chance because the outcomes actually are pretty good. As long as we've got um, good training and uh, good prosthetic fabrication. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think our military members are, are uh, well cared for in that regard. Um, our workers' comp patients have a higher probability of getting more advanced prosthetics. The uh, Medicaid patient is going to have a very hard time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when we even start extending to the even further uh, advancements like the osseo integration that we want to combine with these advanced prosthetics, that gets even uh, harder. There are many places around the world, in, including the United States, that will uh, charge you cash for osseo integration. And uh, if they can bill it to your insurance, that's fine. But they essentially want you to pay, you know, uh, you know, fifty or hundred thousand dollars per osseo integrated limb. The implant is very expensive. It's twenty-five thousand dollar or thirty thousand dollar set of implants that are frequently being used, and um, and for many people, it's a cash type business. We've worked hard at our center here to try to get this covered by a combination of ins insurance and in institutional support, as well as corporate support from some of the companies that are uh, that we participate with in terms of trying to get a good number of, uh, of, of patients with a long enough track record that we have you know excellent data and so uh, that is also its own uh, problem but uh, we try to get as creative as possible but for many people these devices just aren't possible everything's about money um, Okay, any other questions or comments that anybody has before we have to sign off? All right, well, I appreciate everybody's participation. Thank you all for tuning in for us today. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Um, and uh, I will turn it back over to uh, Rafaela and, uh, and then we can close out. Thank you, Dr. Shores. Um, ASP would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session, all webinars in the VCA for the transplant community, the need and achieve debunking the myths series can be found on the My ASP website in two to four business days. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.